Well, hello and welcome to section 3.6 of Transgender Ideology and Gender Dysphoria, A Catholic Response. Uh, this is a commentary that goes along with the book. Uh, and this section that we're looking at is section 3.6, Understanding Scriptures that Might Be Related to the Transgender Issue. Now, for some people who are just interested in the transgender part of this, uh, you know, maybe if you're not interested in the theological part, skip this section. But for people who are Catholic or Christian, um, perhaps Jewish, these might be important uh, things to understand from Scripture. Well, and I guess even if you're not a religious person, if you're having dialogues with religious people, you might want to know what the Scriptures say. So I'll try to keep it brief. Uh, these two areas that we can look at with scripture because obviously transgender itself is not going to be found in the scriptures it's not uh, in there directly um, also um, uh, gender dysphoria as well is a, a 20th century uh, medical condition uh, therefore you're not going to find it uh, medical conditions like that found within the scriptures themselves so you kind of have to look for principles kind of surrounding these ideas within the scriptures in order to get kind of biblical insights. Um, so, so these things, you might look at them and say, well, that's not it. Well, I, I know that's not transgender. <laughs> I'm aware of that, but we're looking for principles. So one of them, one of the sections that could be related would be things like cross-dressing. Now, this is not gender dysphoria. We, we would never consider gender dysphoria a type of cross-dressing. It's not not really within the um, well, it's not within the medical diagnosis. It's not really part of it directly. How is this then related? Well, it's kind of part of the ideology part, right? So the transgender ideology part could be related to cross-dressing. So if you think of, uh, for example, um, somebody who wants to kind of gender bend, right, to break down the patriarchy and to dismantle the binary system, right, part of the idea, gender ideology, then this could apply, right, because this would be voluntarily kind of cross-dressing. Another part, and this is a bit of foreshadowing, but uh, if a person gets some type of... Uh, Kind of sexual stimulation or titillation from cross-dressing uh, or uh, that could possibly fit into here too so well what does the scriptures say about this well if we go back to the book of deuteronomy as a woman shall not wear a man's garment uh, nor shall a man put on a, on woman's clothing for anyone who does such things is an abomination to the lord your god now this is fairly close, you know, within the same chapter as the as other prohibitions uh, about mixing uh, fabrics, uh, uh, material and cloth, uh, sowing your fields with two different type of seeds, right? Th these are clearly within the section of purity code. So this is a purity code uh, section, and it's aimed at um, keeping particularly the priesthood uh, apart, right? So this is particularly priesthood language, uh, the Deuteronomical text, um, and, uh, and, and, and it's for the sake of purity code. So you have to keep that in mind. Uh, the oldest recorded interpretation of this comes from the 11th century, a rabbi, Rashi, who said, a, man sh um, a man's item should not be on a woman, so then he can come out among uh, men uh, for this is f for only this is only for adultery or a man shall not wear a woman's garment so he can go and be around the women. Uh, I know it's kind of a strange image, but the image I ha have, is, uh, well, this uh, get to that later. The, the this is similar, you know, uh, when we go back to earlier in this chapter. Um, the idea of somewhat mentally ill people or people who are sexual predators 
dressing in women's clothing to invade women's spaces. I know that's not popular to say, and it's not the majority. And I know, you know, even saying it could be, you know, creating a problem. I where people are very critical of all that. But there are some people who do this, right? There's some people who put on women's clothing and claim that they're transgender so that they could go and see naked women in the locker room. Now, this is not normal people, right? Normal people don't do that, but there are mentally ill people or criminally insane people who may, right? There may be people who do this. Uh, so that would be prohibitive, right? So th in that case, if you're dressing up uh, in the opposite garb in order to invade the opposite sex spaces, especially for some type of sexual titillation, that would be wrong, right? <laughs> that, that would be clear both on a rational level and on a scriptural level. This would not then refer to somebody who, this gets later on to Blanchard, uh, Blanchard's theory, um, would be called homosexual type transgender people. And these would be people who would be attracted to people of their natal sex. So a boy, somebody who's born a boy and feels as if they're a woman and dresses as a woman to go into the women's locker room when they're attracted to men, well, there's that clearly not a sexual purpose for this because they're not attracted to women. If anything, being in the men's locker room would be more sexually uh, arousing to them, right? So for people with, Blanchard called this autogynephilia, um, I, I mean, a androphilic, androphilic, um, th this would be, this, this wouldn't be uh, a scripture that would be related to them in the earliest interpretations of it. And then even without the earliest interpretations, you still have to look at it in the framing of the um, purity codes, right? There's still kind of purity code thing, rules for the priest. Uh, but there's other, there's other things. Uh, is it sinful to cross-dress? You know, that, that's still on that topic. St. Thomas Aquinas uh, says that, you know, our dress is really to be, be an indication of our inward uh, disposition, right? So if you are rich, you should dress appropriate for a rich person. If you're poor, you should dress appropriate for a per poor person. If you're a priest, you should dress like a priest. <laughs> if you are a king, you should dress like a king. Uh, that Our garb is should represent truth, right? There should be a truthfulness uh, about it. Uh, and part of his reasoning, and again, he, he gives a commentary on that book of Deuteronomy, uh, chapter 22, uh, says, you know, if you're dressing up in the opposite sex clothing um, out of some type of idolatrous superstition, it's condemned, right? If it's idolatrous superstition, uh, nevertheless, that may be done sometimes without sin because some uh, necessity uh, either to hide oneself from one's enemies uh, or through a lack of, the, of other clothes uh, or for some similar motive. Uh, in this one, I picture uh, the cage au faux, you know, the birdcage when the senator is trying to sneak out of the, uh, uh, the, the club and he doesn't want the press to find him and he dresses like a woman to sneak out, right? It, it's not doing it out of a type of sexual titillation or some type of idolatrous superstition. It was as a disguise, right, uh, to disguise himself. Fictitious movie, but, you know, as an example, uh, hide yourself from one's enemies, you know, things like this. Um, this becomes, you know, this is an interesting point. So this is a point of reflection, a point for discussion. You know, are when somebody's dressing as a member of the opposite sex, is it... Uh, out of some type of superstition, uh, right? It could be worship of the body, right? The thinking of the female body as perfect, uh, or it's, you know, wanting to possess the female body, right? Th this would take a psychologist to determine if that was what somebody was doing. But if it's, you know, or, or a young girl thinking that it's so much easier to be a boy and they want to be a boy, you know, that could be idolatrous super superstition. Uh, if again, if it's to prey on 
members of the opposite sex, that would be wrong. Or is, is the reason why somebody showing themselves as masculine or feminine because that is the truth of who they are, right? That, that would be the ethical question in this is, is it the truth, right? Because St. Thomas says, you know, this is about truthfulness. Well, the question then is, what is the truth? <laughs> is it the truth that a person is a boy who's dressing as a girl? Or is it the truth that the person is a, secretly a girl and they're dressing like a girl in order to present the truth, right? That would be uh, an area for discussion, right? You know, and to find the answer for this, well, we have to look to, you know, the science of psychology, the science of medical science, right? Which we're going to do, right? This is chapter six, chapter seven, chapter eight, right? We have multiple chapters dedicated to this. So it's not like I'm pointing to it and not giving any answers. It's just, it's laying the framework at this point, right? There's a framework being laid. So these are some of the questions. Another big part of the prohibition against uh, kind of cross-dressing and, and uh, gender bending, hesitate to call it transgender because, you know, so many mixed motivations for why people did this, it's probably not to do with gender identity so much. Um, but there's this, the stories of a Babylonian, a Babylonian empire that is, uh, the brother-in-law of the uh, king of Babylon who dresses up in women's clothing and comes out with 50 women and plays the harp and sings and acts as a woman um, entertaining the guest while they're watching, you know, kind of a uh, BC level of uh, drag, <laughs> right? Um, kind of a drag, sh the first drag show. Um, it's kind of unclear, you know, it's kind of unclear. Does this person really transgender and that, but because his brother-in-law is the uh, king, he's allowed to do this? Or is this part of the custom? Is this part of, uh, you know, the, the, did the king want this? You know, where, where does this come from? We, well, we don't really have, you know, we don't really know, <laughs> right? We have these accounts. Uh, we don't have the full history of these things. You know, this is, we're talking... 3,000 years ago, right? We're dealing with a long time ago. So we don't really know all the answers to this. But you could see why when the Pentateuch is written, right, the first five books of the Bible, this is right around this same time period. And it's believed that the first five books of the Bible were composed uh, while in Babylonian exile. I know the tradition says Moses wrote the, the, the five books themselves. Most scholars tend to think that's probably not, not the case, at least not written. You know, written was probably during the Babylonian captivity. Here they are amongst the Babylonian captivity, and you have very strong writings against this type of cross-dressing. And at the same time in Babylon, there was this cross-dressing going on. So you could see how this could come from a reaction against uh, uh, the culture, right? And that was some of the purpose of the purity codes, right? The purity codes was to keep Israel separate from the pagan world because once they integrated into the pagan world, they accustomed themselves to pagan customs and pagan gods, and then they were unfaithful, right? So it's kind of like a hedge put around their relationship with God, right? So some of this was a hedge more than uh, that it was intrinsically uh, wrong. It, it was more of a protection against uh, enculturating, right? Uh, then there was also the example in the Christian era, right? In the Christian era, you have the pagan uh, uh, Emperor Nero, who wasn't very good to the Christians, and uh, his wife died and he found a young boy who looked a little bit like his wife, so had him castrated and dressed him up like a woman. And everybody in the court referred to him as the name of Nero's wife. Um, and they just pretended that he was a, a woman <laughs> and the wife. And the church was very against this, right? This is the, the church is being persecuted and the person who's, who's persecuting them is this kind of deranged psycho that castrates young boys and 
treats them like his dead wife, right? That's kind of a strange thing. So you can see why Christianity would be very skeptical of it in the first centuries uh, as well. And just even in terms of like, you know, what are lessons to be learned from this, the power dynamic, uh, you know, that powerful men can castrate children in order to rape them and treat them like women, right? The, 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 just the, the values around it, right? If any reasonable person today were to live in that period, we would see that as clearly deranged behavior which is abusive, right? We would try to free that young person from being forced into near, becoming Nero's wife because he's obsessed and thinks that that young boy is his wife, right? The, this would be abusive, you know, right? The same thing why, you know, in the early church, uh, very against uh, the practices in the baths, right? The, if not, you know, some of the issues with homosexuality in the first century we could agree with today, right? Uh, uh, you have married men who are going into baths and raping teenage, young teenage boys who are slaves, right? We could see why people are very against this, right? Well, well, why are they, you know, so against, you know, these baths and uh, homosexuality well the examples of homosexuality at the time specifically were raping of young boys right so uh, by married straight men right clearly this would not fit within the, the Christian example right <laughs> even by today's standards that would not be acceptable behavior right so the culture the culture does matter right there might be principles but the principles are also based on a, a reality right Okay, there's also examples, again, this is right around from, you know, before we're looking at chapter 22 of Deuteronomy, here's chapter 23 of Deuteronomy. No one whose testicles have been crushed or whose penis has been cut off may come into the assembly of the Lord, right? So again, this is a priestly code made specifically for the priesthood. Um, you know, a priest should not be... Go uh, should not be castrated. Um, oh, it's an interesting point. Um, why? You know, why? Well, you have to kind of know eunuchs, right? What are they talking about? They're talking about eunuchs. They're the people who are castrated. Um, well, what, is the, what, did, what does eunuchs mean at the time of Deuteronomy? Well, eunuchs were people who were slaves, mostly, right? They were slaves. Uh, the, they were probably pretty smart, right? They, they were probably educated enough to read and to administer and to do math and things like that. And the, the master of the house would have a uh, eunuch as his second in command who could take care of all the day-to-day -day operations, right? Uh, what's the fun of being rich and powerful if you're at work all day long? <laughs> right? You'd rather be at your villas and let somebody else do all the math and administering. Well, that's what they did. Uh, and, but you don't want to put some some man in charge of your entire estate, you know, because well, what if he just kills you, <laughs> right? If he kills you, he could take over, um, particularly for a king or something like this. Well, if you have a eunuch who's in charge, well, that means they're not married and they have no children. So what good would it be to be a eunuch who takes over the kingdom when you have no heirs, right? You have no lineage. You have no, you know, well, what happens after you? Well, they just tear down your statues and you're forgotten. Well, what's the point, <laughs> right? Uh, uh, the, your lineage is gone. Plus, people won't accept you as the head of anything because you are a eunuch, right? So you're, you're a second-class citizen. You know, we typically, well, you know, we kind of think of eunuchs as, well, they were homosexual. That's why they were in charge of protecting the, the women, right? The, think of eunuchs watching over the brothel. Well, eunuchs watched over much more than the harem of women. They watched over the entire estates, right? They watched over everything. Um, why? Because they have nothing for themselves, right? They have no household of their own. They have no, they're not married. They have no children. They have nothing. 
They completely live for the will of their master, right? Day and night, all day long, all they do is take care of the, the needs of their master. An undivided slave, that's what a eunuch is. Well, how can you be that undivided slave of a master and be a priest of the Lord? You can't, right? You can't serve true masters, right? This is the, and Jewish people didn't, did not castrate people. So it meant your, your master was also a pagan. So how could you have a pagan master, right? You're responsible for a pagan master's estate and responsible for um, the priestly duties of the temple. You can't, <laughs> right? You have to be in, entirely devoted to the temple or be devoted to your job, but you can't have both. You can't do both. So that makes some sense why they say this. It's not just don't castrate just because, but because it has a spiritual meaning. If we move to the prophetic tradition in Isaiah, uh, Isaiah is more open to the idea of eunuchs uh, entering, right? Uh, there were also prohibitions against foreigners uh, going into the temple. But in Isaiah, he says, uh, my house will be a house of prayer, right? Uh, he says, even the eunuchs will say, will come to me. Um, you know, they'll, they'll say, surely I'm excluded because I'm a eunuch or I'm a foreigner. And the Lord says, I'm not. I'm for everyone, right? Uh, come with me. Come to the holy mountain. Find a home in me. Um, you will offer burnt offerings uh, and sacrifices, which will be acceptable, right? What is that? Priestly duties, right? They're talking about eunuchs having priestly duties, right? Isaiah is presenting a completely new version, right? A welcoming version. And both are in the Old Testament, right? So you have a prohibition against eunuchs and people like that being admitted into the assembly of the Lord. And then you have Isaiah saying, come on in, <laughs> right? Uh, so you have both, right? You have both traditions. One's the prophetic tradition. One is the priestly tradition, right? So you have two traditions going on here. Um, well, how about in the New Testament then, right? So we have in the Old Testament divided, right? This idea of medical transitioning <laughs> or gender neutral or things like this. Well, Jesus brings up the eunuchs himself. He says, uh, you know, his, his apostles asked, well, is it better not to marry at all? And Jesus said, well, kind of, yeah, it's better not to marry at all if you can accept it. Uh, said, some are incapable of marriage because they are born that way. That would be a kind of intersex or sexual abnormality, right? Atypical sexuality because uh, they are made so by others, castrated, right? Most people don't choose to be castrated. Usually other people castrate them. <laughs> um, and then some have renounced marriage for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. They become eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Well, the church has made it very clear in the early church that they don't mean physically, right? Because pointed out a lot that uh, if you castrate yourself, it doesn't remove concupiscence. It doesn't remove desire. So if you lust after a woman in your heart, it doesn't matter that you're castrated if you still are lusting in your heart. It's better to control your emotions than it is to mutilate your body. That that's the point. Um, so in the so what do you do with this in the well? And well, it's Jesus's idea of eunuchs called for the kingdom is for the same reason you had eunuchs in the Old Testament, right? Undevoted, you know, undivided servants, slaves of the master. Well, Jesus is saying it's better to be an undivided, uncompromising slave to God, right? Uh, servant of God. Um, be like eunuchs for God. What does that mean? Not married, with no children, entirely devoted, right? That's what a eunuch would be for the kingdom of God. You don't have to chop your body up to do that. That's just what you would do. But interestingly, Jesus also brings up some are made so by others. So he's talking about castrated people. Some have been born that way, right, with this type of maybe intersex con condition, right, atypical sexuality. 
uh, a theologian pointed out, you know, Jesus heals a lot of people, right? He does a lot of healing, but Jesus never heals a eunuch, right? Kind of interesting, right? Even when we think in this very notable case of the Ethiopian eunuch, right? The first Gentile baptism, the Ethiopian eunuch, Philip does not heal the eunuch, right? There's no healing of the eunuch. Uh, the eunuch, in some sense, is perfectly fine. <laughs> right, the eunuch is perfectly fine the way they are put on Christ, but you don't have to. Jesus doesn't make them whole, right? The way that uh, the bleeding woman or the, the, the people who are paralyzed or crippled in some way, right? He, Jesus makes them whole again. The eunuch, is, the eunuch is not, right? Eunuch is spiritually made whole, but not physically changed at all. So there's room, right? So this is all kind of saying, again, part of the discussion, is it okay if somebody was born intersex, born with an atypical sexuality, could that then be used for the purpose of undevoted, uh, not undevoted, undivided uh, service to God, right? Could this be a type of vocation? And could it be a vocation to have an atypical sexuality, which would then, you know, you wouldn't fit into the the marriage system, right? The marriage line, right? Because you have this kind of atypical sexuality. Um, is there a space for for that right within the church now this is tough because you know this is this would make everyone mad right so if you are on the atypical gender side you might say so you're saying because i was born with atypical sex sex organs uh, intersex you know some type of atypical sexuality i should be celibate for the rest of my life well, perhaps that is what Jesus is suggesting, right? <laughs> right? This is uh, maybe not a popular view, but you know, perhaps that is what he's saying because he, he really sees this kind of eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom as the higher higher vocation for all who can accept it, right? For all who can accept it. Um, it could also make uh, other people mad because you're saying... While well, you're saying these intersex people or people with atypical sexuality have a specific vocation within the church, because right now we don't have a specific vocation for them, right? People with atypical sexuality, we don't have it. We don't have a a brotherhood of intersex people or a sister, you know. We don't have an intersex religious community, right? For example, we don't have an apostolate of uh, atypical sexuality. Um, might not be a bad idea, right? <laughs> a ministry, uh, an apostolate dedicated to it, where they are devoted to the service of God. Well, if you don't, if we don't call people to it, we can't be surprised when they don't step up to it, right? If you made it available, you know, maybe they'd say yes, right? <laughs> maybe, but it's not really being offered, right? We don't really, haven't really created a pathway for people with atypical sexuality within the church, right? Um, we have very clear binary vocations, but we don't have uh, atypical sexuality pathways. Uh, and lastly, just to close this off, you know, the other part of this that we can see within the scriptures and tradition is that within these cultures, this goes back to gender variance too, um, you see people who have uh you know a eunuch may have been have an atypical sexuality right either born that way or made so by others um but they had a very central role within the community right they have a very important and defined role within the the community if you're a eunuch you knew what you were going to do you knew who you were people know who you were uh you had an important job to fulfill even in a secular way you had an important job to fulfill in our present situation, we really don't have a very clearly defined vocation um, or formation, right? For you to 
uh, have an atypical sexuality means you're kind of pushed to the outskirts of society, whereas eunuchs were in the center of the community before. Again, I think it would be useful if we had some way of include, you know, a pathway of inclusion for people who have atypical sexualities where they could put their, who they were born as, right, with all of our deficiencies and brokennesses. Is there a pathway, right? You know, things like the community uh, of sisters that, that have a, uh, for people with Down syndrome, right? There's a community of sisters with Down syndrome Right, this is a beautiful idea, right? People with Down syndrome are called to holiness too. Why not have a community <laughs> for people with Down syndrome? But why not have a community with people with uh, other type of uh, atypical sexual uh, abnormalities as well, right? Why, why, why couldn't there be uh, a gender dysphoric um, community dedicated to some apostolate within the church that had a uh, that had a formation right this isn't an, an unthinkable thing right if they don't fit into the current systems well okay but could there be could there could, could there be a system for for them right could we create something i know that might be a bold statement but i i suspect uh, but i think I, I i'm a strong advocate that it, if we want people to step up to the bold call of Christ, right? You know, be eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom. We should encourage it. And, but people can't, but people need to, people need a path, right? I think that's my point. Okay, well, that's all I have for this time. Next, we will get into science.